All right, well, such an honor uh, to be here with you guys and to be able to go over this very, very important topic of uh, critical race theory. And I wanted to, really my goal is to help us to kind of have a worldview. I'm not here to tell you uh, exactly like what to think, but to help shape how we think. We have a lot of things flying at us today in culture. Good. Um, and so uh, it's, it's becoming really difficult. The less that the church addresses issues, the more then we're just letting people kind of go out there and figure out how this is supposed to work, what it's supposed to look like. And a lot of the arguments are, are actually quite good, honestly. So it's easy to get pulled into what's going on. So we're going to look at critical race theory. The first thing I want to do to give you an idea of, of kind of an overview, big picture, these, uh, these first two images I'm going to show you actually appear on the Smithsonian, uh, Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture a year ago. So this is on their website. This isn't a graphic I pulled up. It's, it's literally it's what they put on their website. They took some heat for it and they pulled it down, but it gives you an idea of uh, the overall view, okay? And it works a lot better in the shadows. And I think where they kind of messed up is they just came right out and said, here it is. And that's what got the pushback. So check out the first image. No? All right. Okay. Uh, let me read it to you. First, here's the first picture. Is rugged individualism. Okay? And it has this idea of what does it mean for white culture in the United States, okay? And it's the idea of rugged individualism. So in other words, what I'm about to tell you are white traits. You ready? Okay. The individual is the primary unit. Self-reliance, independence and autonomy is highly valued and rewarded. Individuals assume to be in control of their environment. You get what you deserve. That's one of the things considered to be a white attribute. Family structure is also considered whiteness, and here it is. The nuclear family, a father, a mother, 2.3 children, is the ideal social unit. Husbands as the breadwinner and head of the household. Wife is a homemaker or subordinate to the husband. Children should have their own rooms or be independent. That's another white construct. Here it is. Uh, objective, being objective is whiteness. Rational linear thinking is whiteness. Cause and effect of relationships, again, whiteness. Quantitative emphasis, whiteness. Based on Northern European immigrants experience in the United States, heavy focus on the British Empire, the primacy of Western, Greek and Roman, and Judeo-Christian tradition. Protestant work ethic. Hard work is the key to success. That's a white idea. Work before play, another white idea. If you don't meet your goals, you didn't work hard enough, okay? Then here's religion, the whiteness of religion. Christianity is the norm. Anything other than Judeo-Christian tradition is foreign. There's no tolerance for deviation from a single God or concept. So all of that like monotheistic religion, those are all under the terms of whiteness, all right? Status, power, and authority. Wealth equals your worth. Your job is who you are, respecting authority, heavy value on ownership of goods, space, and property, planning for your future, delayed gratification, progress is always best, tomorrow will be better. When you think about time, following rigid schedules is whiteness. Time viewed as a commodity is whiteness. Aesthetics, space in European culture, Steak and potatoes, bland is best. I love steak, I don't know, okay. Uh, women's, women's beauty is based on blonde, thin Barbies. Man's attractiveness is based on economic status, power, and intellect. Holidays is based on Christian religions, based on white history and male leaders. Justice is based on English common law, protect property and entitlements, and intent counts. Your intent is a white idea. Competition, be number one, win at all costs, winner-loser dichotomy, action orientation, master and control nature, must always do something about a situation, aggressiveness and extroversion, decision-making, 
just in general. And finally, majority rules, especially when whites have power. So I'm gonna give you some idea of, of critical race theory and we're gonna, I'm gonna hit different times the background of it. Here's the best way I can describe the discussion because it's gonna seem, what I'm about to say is gonna seem incredibly counterintuitive, okay? <clears throat> you have a homeowner, here's the homeowner. Maybe that's you, you own a home. You live next door to someone who rents a home, okay? And then you have me in the picture, okay? Now, my goal is to introduce a way of number one, dividing the two of you who are neighbors, that's number one, okay? And then pacifying both groups of people at the same time, okay? And I'll tell you what my end game is in just a second, okay? So what I do is I interject into the situation that the person that owns the home, owns the home because it was ill-gotten in some way, shape, or form, okay? And I bring up history and go into, go into slavery, go into America's history. And so what I put on this person is that the reason they own their own home is because of all of these advantages that they were granted, okay? Now the deal is, what I then, and this is critical, for it to work, for it to work effectively, it needs a few ingredients. Real events, real history, real hurts, and real pain. It wouldn't work if I couldn't connect it to real events like slavery and real injustices in our world. What makes it work is it has to have some stuff that, that kind of you can attach it to, right? The next thing that I need is for the person that owns the house to feel guilty for owning the house now, okay? And the guiltier I can make them feel, the more that I then have them in a position where I want them, okay? Now, at the same time, I'm also giving the same message to the person that rents the house. This is why you rent a house instead of owning, like a, owning a house like these people out here, okay? And I keep putting that message out. This group gets defensive or they get pacified. But here's the point. Even if they get defensive, the people that own the house, I'm actually achieving my goal. The people on this side that are renting feel as though I am fighting their fight for them, you see? They feel as though they now have a voice that's speaking on behalf of their hurts, their pain, and their history. What neither group realizes is by injecting this into this neighborhood with these two individuals, I have, in effect, turned them against one another. You see that? And in doing so, I have, in effect, pacified both. One, because the group that rents now believes I'm speaking for them. The other group is now pacified because they're now kind of feeling the pressure and the stress of, do I even speak up? You see what's happened? Now, here's the catch. Here's the catch. I, who interjected the whole issue, I have no interest in your little spat that I started. You see that? My interest is actually to divide and conquer. My goal is to become both of your landlords. My goal is that if you rent, you will be paying me. And my goal is if you buy, I'll own your land and you will be paying me. And that's the twist, you see? The twist is, the goal is division and control. And the history of this, you may not know, but critical race theory actually is like the grandchild of this whole discussion. Critical race theory was originally critical theory. And critical theory became critical legal theory. And critical legal theory became critical race theory. This all started in Europe, okay? This started in Europe back in the 1800s. And the goal was, how can just a handful of people control an otherwise much larger mass of people? And what they found in Europe over the course of 100, 150 years was that going the legal system route is a massive headache. It's very, very difficult to divide people and gain control of a nation. So what you have to do is find some way to pit one group against the other. 
in Europe, what they found is to get inside of, of schools like Cambridge and Oxford and the most prestigious universities in all of Europe. Introduce the ideas into the schools and influence tomorrow's thinkers, how they process. You have to realize that people that are championing this are not only very, very smart, they're incredibly patient. They play the long game, not the short game, okay? And so they, they introduced it in the schools, but what worked in Europe was actually turning social classes against one another. And that actually helped. You may not know this, but it's like a hundred years ago. It wasn't the Soviet Union, it was just Russia. It became communist because of this strategy and it worked incredibly well. Once the people were destabilized and the middle class took a beating and now you have the renters and the owners now fighting and turning on one another, it created a vacuum in the opening and the reason for now the homeowner or the person who really just wants control, who can care less about the argument, you understand? They don't care anything about any of this. They want to control both groups of people. And so for there, what worked in Russia as an example, where the people that were the hard working class breaking their back have nothing to show for it in the elite class. What ended up happening, if you're familiar with what ended up happening with Russia, is the people on the bottom stayed on the bottom. In fact, they suffered to the hundreds of millions, a hundred million. The people at the top, they were also shut down. And what they were sold sounded great. What they ended up with was a unbelievable mess that they're still trying to work through to this day okay so realize that the arguments are real like what i mean is like race slavery and what part of the bait for some of us in this room that i want to i want to challenge challenge us on is not taking a defensive posture i'm not saying not do anything but the goal is to make you defensive and to turn you against the other group of folks. Does that make sense? Rather than seeking unity. That's the goal, division. Division, division, division. Once you divide people, they become weaker as a society. Once communication breaks down, they become weaker as a society. The people that you see with a microphone saying all of this, in some cases, believe, wholeheartedly believe that what they're fighting for is race and equality. That's real. It's the people, two people removed that are never on camera, that are calling the shots, okay? Every group has useful idiots. That's the theory, okay, you with me? We good? Okay, maybe we're not good, but maybe you're with me. All right, so here it is, all right? So the end game has nothing to do with the topic, okay? And what they discovered in America uh, back in the 1970s was that turning classes against one another don't work. They couldn't turn rich and poor. You know that, you, you live that. You know it doesn't work, here's why. Because you can have somebody who is worth a hundred million dollars get online and tell you how you're polluting and ruining the atmosphere, right? But they took a private jet to get there. They have seven SUVs for protection to get to the podium. And we take that, we put up with that. Matter of fact, when you see somebody who probably has tons of money, Maybe your first thought is, man, I'd love some of that, right? Like, you're not thinking, I hate their guts. So that's what, that's what they discovered. In America, it wasn't going to work. So they started now then targeting a different, and had to evolve and change the game. Just doing critical theory wasn't going to work. They had to find a foothold in America. The foothold in America became critical race theory in the 70s, all right? Derek Bell was on staff at Harvard Law School. And he pulled underneath him two students, last name Delgado and Stefanitz, to produce this paper. What's interesting is why Bell was kind of the mastermind behind critical race theory. It was given as to these two students of his as more or less being the people that helped champion it. Again, removing the voice and the force one level removed. But even Bell, really wasn't the, the beginning and the seed of this whole discussion, do you understand? And what they realized was ultimately, this would work. Social classes turning against each other would never work. What would work 
is turning race with the history in America, they could make this work. So that's where critical race theory and what it implies and what it has to have to be successful is it's in the title. It's critical. And good people with a good heart, what's your goal when somebody's critical? You want to address the criticism. How may I help you, sir? How may I help you, ma'am? What can I do for you? Oh, I'm sorry, you didn't like it. Okay. And what it does is it ends up just getting people on a never-ending wheel to resolve something that's not designed to be resolved. You understand? It's not designed to ever come to resolution. And the theory actually behind it, quite simply, is, is that you are, especially if you are white, you are a racist. If you are black and you, you, you champion any of the things I just said earlier, you're also a racist. You're thinking white. You understand? And even if you don't think you're a racist, you're still a racist. You have blind spots to your racism. You just don't know it. And even if you go to the furthest possible extent to be charitable or lend a hand or walk alongside with someone of another race, this theory would actually say, even then you're only doing it for selfish gain. It is a sum total game that's set up for you to lose. There is no resolving it. It's meant to keep you on your heels and it's meant to pacify people until you have absolute control of those people. That's how this works. And the end game, quite literally, is Marxism. This is how it's worked all over the world. And so the critical theory, turning into critical legal theory, turning into critical race theory, is how you get here, okay? And it all goes back into our universities. Those of you that have spent any time in a university, okay? Any number of you here, here with us visiting and back there, okay? I guarantee if I, could, if I could interview anybody that's 35 and younger, they had to write things in a paper or not say exactly what they wanted to say just so they could get through the class. There it is, okay? So the way that our, it's actually our institutions and our schools that are under assault. This is the means of introducing this particular thinking. And the goal, of course, ultimately, is Marxism. Critical race theory, if this makes any sense, is a tool. It's not a topic. It is a tool to be leveraged to accomplish a goal that's targeting your country, your values, your families, your children, your faith. The biggest stumbling blocks as it exists right now to this movement, going back 150 years ago, not just right now, okay, has always been capitalism, freedom of expression and thought, and Christian values. Those are the tripping points. Right now, the way your society functions is what's under attack. The next thing that's under attack is Christian values. That's the point is to come after your value system and to come after your Christian value system, quite literally, okay? So, like I said, it's all about going after elite institutions. It will use words like tolerance and equity. Read closely when you see things that say equity. Equity is not equality. Equality is equal opportunity. Equity is equal outcomes, no matter the cost, okay? Uh, I'll give you an example of one. Oregon governor, I don't know if you caught this, because she didn't know, uh, she didn't know big signing thing, okay? It was all under the radar. You may not even know this. Here's an example of, of, of equity. Oregon governor signs a bill suspending math reading requirements for all high school graduates in the entire state of Oregon for the next three years. Like half the room just did this, okay? All right, and here's why. They cite black, Latino, Latinx, indigenous, Asian Pacific Islander, tribal, and students of color. This is the first step to, uh, in, in thinking of them, we're gonna suspend math and reading for high school graduates for the next three years. 
This is real. Please go look it up. This happened in August 10th. Just happened. And the goal is equity. Everyone will graduate. Doesn't matter if they can't read or do math. Everyone graduates. Now think about now what happens if you pass it in your university. What happens when you start doing that for medical school students? Nurses, like our family that's here today, they don't even have simple math, science, and chemistry as baseline because we've washed people through and now you're on the operating table. You know, it's interesting. The two countries, you may not know this, that have actually positioned themselves out of the hardest to take down with this Marxist theology, ideology, ironically is America, yes, okay, and of all places, you may not know this, India. And India is in a very similar fight right now. And actually, you may not know this, Gandhi, actually they have the untouchables in their society. They had a caste system, okay? And we talked about that several weeks ago and what's going on in India. But Gandhi comes along and he says, here it is, free education for the untouchables, free. But we will not lower a single standard in our educational system. So if you're in the untouchable class and you want to go through medical school, it won't cost you a dime. But we won't lower our standards in India for you to graduate from medical school one inch. And what's now happened 40 plus years later in India is people from the lowest class in the society are now scholars, doctors, highly influential, and highly successful. So there is something about charity, Christian charity. There is something about loving your neighbor. Those are all real things. And there is something about this collision of maintaining your value system at the exact same time, okay? So finally, I wanna, I wanna bring us now to where I think the real, ultimately the collision happens here. Because this is what's happening in your schools. It's about infiltration. It's about you know, using words that sound familiar. It's really all about in the Marxist theology, no government, no borders, nothing. It's getting everything pulled under one group and then run by a few groups of people. Remember, keep that image in your mind, the homeowner and this person. And I explain to them that it's because they're racist, because of their racist history, because of slavery and everything else. And meanwhile, while, while I watch the two burn, I step in and take over both. It's a tool, it is a weapon, it's not a topic. And this is how it's worked for almost 200 years, this theology, this ideology, okay? And I say theology only because the people at the top function like that of a god. They won't, at the very top, live under the very edicts that they give their people, they won't. So here's what I wanna help us begin to think about. I want us to look at Exodus chapter 12, 14 and 15 and 25 and 27, because believe it or not, one of the fallacies that you're fed is that scripture doesn't have a paradigm of how to navigate race relations, how to navigate our world at all. And a lot of times with a lot of the topics that we're hitting, I'm hitting them on purpose because I wanna help you see that when you get into a discussion about a topic like this or the next three that we're gonna cover, that somebody throws out terminology and you start flipping through your Bible going, Wait a minute, I don't find this term, I don't find this word. Exactly. It's not because God didn't think of it. It's not because there isn't a paradigm for it. It's designed to move you off of truth. And once you've been moved off of truth, you can be manipulated and moved any way, anyhow, if somebody wants to move you. Okay? So it's about getting scripture to be our lens. So let's check out Exodus chapter 12. We have that one? Good, let's roll. Otherwise, okay, good. We're not flying blind all day. Excellent. Okay, here it is. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you're to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from, that, from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh day be cut off from Israel. When you enter the land the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you, then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, 
who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. What am I saying? Biblically, biblically, there is a precedent of looking back at one's history honestly. They literally created a meal that they would eat every year for the sole purpose of remembering two things. Number one, slavery. Number two, that God rescued them out of it. So part of the way that this works about burning the house down is to get people in such a defensive posture that they lose their sense of compassion for their neighbor. They lose their sense of understanding for their neighbor. They lose a heart for their neighbor of someone of a different ethnicity, race, or background. That's part of what it's designed to do. Quite literally what happens in the entire Old Testament, by the time Jesus shows up for the Last Supper, they are in the course of eating something that reminds them of the bitter taste of slavery, bitter herbs. They would eat lamb, remind them of the, the blood of the lamb put across the doorposts. They would have unleavened bread to remind them that God had no place for sin. They could remember it. So remembering it and acknowledging, as you would see in scripture, its generational impact and what it can create in a society is real. Children of Israel who had become the Israelites, who then become the Jews, they were a screwed up mess for generations. You know, when you flip your pages, you're covering like 300 years and they're still a mess. They still struggle. What I'm saying is there's a biblical precedent for how all of these, all this stuff historically, it's even happened in our country, how it affects a nation. But there's a biblical way to think about it and the biblical way of addressing it. How is it addressed in scripture? You want to know what their methodology is in all of scripture? Faith, family, education. You look in the Old Testament, their faith was central, their families were locked up tight, and education. Their education oftentimes wove in the fourth, the first two. Look at what you see critical race theory doing. Undermining faith, undermining family, and undermining education. If you show me a culture that's gone insane, I will show you families that have gone insane. If you show me families that have gone insane, I will show you a marriage that went crazy somewhere. And if they show me a marriage that went crazy somewhere, I can show you individuals who are crazy. Individual to the marriage, to the family, to the culture. What they understood biblically is we have to get these things in order to affect our culture, faith, family, education. So you can remember this stuff, you can look at it and acknowledge the effects that it's had on different people groups, but the way forward is faith, family, education. If you want to move forward as a nation and you keep wanting to pull faith out of it or family out of it, good luck. You want to redefine all of it, good luck. It's not going to work. So there is a way for you to go, there is a way forward, and God had that plan, okay? And it can be a beautiful thing. Faith, family, education. That's what you see here. That's what you see in the Old Testament. Then here, check this out, Galatians 3, 23 to 29. Before the coming of his faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, and your Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. At this time, 2,000 years ago, you had every kind of class system you could even imagine. You had different levels of slavery at that time. You had different levels within the society at that time. And Paul, who is a pure blood Jew, whose family goes all the way back to the original 12 tribes, highly, highly educated. If anybody ever could have looked down his nose at a group of people, it's Paul. 
And he's tasked with somehow bringing this group of people along. He's got men and women. Women had next to no rights or privileges. They weren't highly, highly respected in society. There's his first problem. He's got Jews who respect the law and have this incredible history of walking and have had hardships. Their people over the previous 2,000 years have been pulled into slavery multiple times. He's got them. Then he's got Greeks who, for all we know, the week before are engaged in, to keep it like a kid's show, okay, all kinds of stuff that aren't going to be on TV, okay, and now they've joined, and they're still trying to figure out, is this like Zeus, is this like, you know, like, he's got, got them all in a room, then he's got people that are free, like him, then he's got people that have some degree of slavery, they're all in a room, they all got bones to pick with the other one, they all have a history with the other one, they all have hardship and feelings and reasons to hate one another, quite literally. And his point is that in Christ Jesus, you are the same. You're here. Reset button. You want to be the seed of Abraham? What he means is you want to be a part of this family lineage that's been so privileged? You are. How? Through Jesus. And you may be going, well, how come that didn't happen? I don't know. I don't think we've really taken the words of Jesus that seriously. That's why. Regardless of what we like to say, I just don't think we have. And this is where he's coming from. When you are in the presence of God, the kingdom of God will see no difference. You want to be woven and grafted into a family that is privileged? This is what it looks like. Followers of Jesus. And he quite literally uses language that their outside is transformed along with their guts, their inside, their heart, their mind, their souls. This is his way of saying everyone's on the same playing field. This is mind-blowing for 2,000 years ago. A mind-blowing message. Absolutely countercultural. Flew in the face of Rome. Flew in the face of the social movements at that time. This is what the culture will look like, see? And we're going to walk together from now on. As we look forward as a culture and as a society, the fallacy is that Jesus cannot be brought into the town square, that Jesus cannot be a part of the discussion, that you're supposed to keep him in this building until we see you again next Sunday, maybe. That is exactly what movements like the one we're talking about this morning want. There is one leader of all leaders of all time that would leave glory, splendor, riches, and wealth. There's only one leader of all time that would descend to be amongst the lowest of lows, the most depraved and broken of people caught in the most broken of circumstances and situations. There's only one leader who would actually believe his words to such an extent that he would trade his life for those words to be real and realized for an entire group of people for all time. And that person is Jesus. And may we be a nation and a group of people that do not Listen to everything that's hitting us from all ends and keep Jesus on the sidelines. You want to think about your world. You want to think about how to move forward in your world. Galatians 3 is how you move forward in your world. Galatians chapter 3. Liberty, freedom, grace, mercy, and love that's found in Jesus. A new identity that's found in Jesus and Jesus alone. May God bless our country. May God bless our public schools and that even Christians that hear my voice or see me online, that you begin to speak up in your school board meetings, that you begin to speak up with the stuff that you're hearing your kids come home with, that you begin to speak up when you start seeing your culture being rotted away with deception and lies, turning you against your neighbor when you're called to love your neighbor, even called to love your enemy. This is the way of Jesus while you and I were still yet sinners, while you and I were still depraved, 
while you and I were still lost and disinterested in grace whatsoever. Jesus would die for you and I. The ungodly is what we were and who we were. Grace, mercy, love, forgiveness, and an identity in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Next week, we will pick up with Chad Williams to talk about the events of Afghanistan and how we filter the previous 20 years through the lens of the gospel and a life walking with Jesus. Love you all. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your mercy that's new every single day. No doubt there's a lot to think about this morning. And a lot of us want to see racial healing in our country and profound changes in our nation. We want to see the least, the last, and the lost in every respect of our society be blessed. This movement that's happening, God, give us new eyes and new ears, incredible discernment. The temptation is to keep you on the sideline and out of the discussion. Out of our lips, they come bold statements, honesty and truth about Jesus. There is a path forward, but that path is not separate from you. Do this work in our lives, do this work in our marriages, our families, our homes, our communities, our country, and our world. It's in your name, Jesus. Amen.